Hey folks, uh, the video you were about to watch was swiped from a live stream we did for a virtual convention. Uh, the video itself is largely unedited, so it will contain stumbling and rambling as well as odd background noises caused either by my dogs or by my, at the time, roommate. So please do bear with me. That said, I do hope you enjoy the video and be sure to leave a like and a comment. Bye. Greetings everyone at Virtual Fernal Equinox. This uh, stream has been pre-recorded. Um, for me, it is live, but for you guys watching in the future times, it is not. So, uh, prepare for hiccups because I suck at life. But welcome to First Suit Making 102. This is going to be an hour, an hour and a half long panel. We will be talking about the more advanced tools and techniques to use in First Suit Making. So, for those who already know a little bit about First Suit Making and want to up their game, this panel is for you. If not, go check out First Suit Making 101. Uh, which is a panel more towards uh, beginners. Let's get started. So uh, during this panel, we'll be talking out uh, talking about several different tools and materials. Uh, specifically, we are going to be talking about the materials listed currently on stream, uh, which is going to be the Monster Makers Ed Head and Monster Clay, uh, various products from Smooth On such as Plasti Paste, which apparently I wrote twice for some reason. Uh, and I never noticed, so please forgive me about that. Uh, Rebound 25, Ser uh, Serenite Wax, Thybex, Dragon Skin, Flex Foam, Smooth Cast, and so forth. Uh, and then we'll also go over some other uh, stuff such as uh, hand wefting, degassing vacuum chambers, um, and 3D printers and so forth, depending on how much time we have. So, let's talk about molds. There are a couple different types of molds. Uh, there are your soft silicone, rubber, latex type molds. There are resin molds, uh, plaster molds, and there are uh, two-part molds and free-pour molds. Free-pour molds are probably the thing that you'll encounter most often. Um, and it's basically any solid block in which you pour a new material into and then pull out. That's called a free-pour mold. Uh, two-part molds are more complex and they are used to either cast very large objects or objects that are very complex. Uh, now the type of mold you use will depend on what you're trying to make. If you're the final product that you're casting is going to be something hard like resin, you're going to want to use a, small, a soft mold. Otherwise you're going to have no way of getting it out. The same can be true the other way around. So if you have a product that is soft, you're going to want to use a hard mold because otherwise you're not going to have enough support for the object inside. And anything that has a really complex shape or is very large, such as, uh, you know, horns or antlers or even a big head base, you're going to want to use a two-part mold. Now, each mold has their own applications. Hard molds um, are used for casting soft products, as I said. Uh, they can be used to cast things like paw pads, uh, noses out of silicone, uh, casting foam head bases, or even toes, you know, for feet paws, or, you know, big ears for, like, bunnies. Um, when making a hard mold in order to cast a soft product, you're going to want to use something like uh, resin if you want something more long-term, uh, and you want to be able to reuse it a whole bunch. But if you're only going to be casting one or maybe even a couple, a uh, handful of casts, you can use even plaster. It's cheap, it's versatile, but it does erode quite quickly, so it's only really used for, useful for one-off casts. Uh, another thing you can do is you can use 3D printed molds uh, for casting large items. But they're limited to lower poly molds, uh, lo lower poly models, um, just because the, of the capability of um, picking up details within that type of mold. Similarly, soft molds are used to cast hard products. So you can cast things like realistic eyes out of clear resin, so which would be smooth cast 325, which is a clear casting resin. Or you can cast toony eye blanks out of an opaque resin like smooth cast 300. You can similarly also cast foam or resin bases uh, if you're using a two-part mold or cast claws or horns um, with a, fr a simple free pour mold. Um, and you want to use a silicone or a rubber if you want to cast something small, like claws uh, or teeth. Uh, but if you want to cast something very large, like a, a head base, you're going to want a two-part mold. Uh, regarding two-part molds, um, like I said, they're used to cast large objects. 
uh, and they consist of two main parts, uh, which is the mold itself, that's usually made out of silicone or latex or rubber, uh, and the, the mold jacket, which is a, a, a firm material that supports the mold itself, because the mold is usually very, very thin uh, in these types of molds. So if you just had the mold itself, it would collapse under its own weight and you'd never be able to get the shape you want, which is why you need a mold jacket, which is sometimes called a shell, depending on who you're talking to. Um, oops, uh, I guess I put that in the wrong order, my apologies, uh, but a mold jacket uh, can be made out of a wide variety of materials. We typically use, make ours out of plastic paste. We'll talk a little bit more about the construction of uh, these types of molds in a little bit. Um, now about resin. Sorry, there's a lot of information to go through, so we're going to be kind of bouncing kind of, you know, A to B quite quickly, so do bear with us. Um, now, there are two different main kinds of, uh, well, actually there's m multiple, there are, but the two main ones you see usually in fursuit making are an opaque resin, one that clears white, and then a clear resin, which stays clear. Um, fast curing resins will have more bubbles than slowing curing ones, so if you're working with something like a smooth cast 300 or 325 even, uh, they tend to cure in about 10 minutes, which is fantastic if you want to, you know, quickly pull and be ready to demold. Um, but then they have a lot of bubbles. Whereas if you take uh, a very slow curing resin, you're able to kind of control, um, you know, how much air it gets into it. And the air will slowly release over time as well as it cures because it heats up and pushes the air out. Um, so, but, so a longer curing resin, you know, is will have less bubbles, but they'll never be bubble free. The only way to make a resin perfectly bubble free and perfectly clear uh, is to have like a degassing chamber, also called a vacuum chamber. The problem with those is that they're very expensive. You can get a degassing chamber for like two grand. Uh, I personally don't have one and I don't make enough clear eyes to really warrant buying one. So in the case of, you know, someone like me, you can actually buy acrylic blanks from, you know, China <laughs> for like $2 um, rather than casting clear resin eyes um, because they're perfectly cl um, clear because they actually use a degassing chamber. Um, and, you know, the only thing with acrylic um, or glass eyes is that they're a lot more fragile than resin. Uh, resin is shatterproof, so you can throw it down a flight of stairs and you'll do nothing to it. Whereas acrylic or glass, you drop it and it could fracture into a million pieces. But, you know, so each one has their own positives and negatives. Um, now, one thing uh, some people may not realize is that resins can be dyed. So there are special pigments that you can add to resins. Um, the main pigments they usually use for resin are called So Strong, uh, and they're another uh, product by Smooth On, uh, which I'll be talking about them a lot because they sell a lot of products that are used for making molds, casting, and the like, which is very useful for fursuit making and crafting in general. But you can also add UV pigments or UV powders um, to resin. So the powder, so the UV powders themselves are not really colored or they're very, very lightly colored to the human eyes. So for example, there is a UV blue green powder that looks slightly very, very, very pastel green or mint, um, when you add it to the resin and it makes like the white resin slightly off white, slightly, you know, kind of an off white, off green color, but then it glows bright blue. Um, under UV light or green under, you know, black, under uh, glow in the dark. So it glows, glows in the dark and is UV reactive. So UV pigments are quite wonderful. They're quite nice and they can, you know, you can create a wonderful array of effects with them. Uh, I like to use them uh, for eyes and, and for teeth uh, because it is cheaper and doesn't require, um, you know, battery packs like uh, LEDs do. Uh, as for, uh, like I said, this is what I meant by I put this slide in the wrong part. This is supposed to be a little bit after, but that's my fault. Um, but as for going back to um, how to make a two-part mold, there are several steps, which I've listed here that people can take a look at. Mm, excuse me, I'm hiccuping. I just ate a bunch of food before the stream because I suck. 
So, the first thing you want to do is you're going to sculpt your master, whatever it is. I, um, if you're normally with a two-part mold, you're going to call, you're going to uh, you're wanting to make a mold of something more complex in shape or something very large that would be otherwise difficult to demold if it was all one solid piece, such as a head or uh, horns or antlers even. Um, so you're not going to really want to use a two-part mold for, say, a nose. It's just a waste of material and a waste of time. So in this case, I'm going to describe kind of the process for making a uh, two-part mold of, say, a head, say a canine, for example, because those are quite common and quite popular. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to sculpt your master. You can either sculpt it out of a sulfur-free clay, such as monster clay, or you can 3D print it. Um, when 3D printing, um, the best way to do it is to print it hollow, so a 0% infill, with, say, a, you know, 3 to 4 millimeter shell. I'll talk a little bit more on 3D printing a little bit later, but... Once you have your master, which is the original sculpt, you can begin preparing for molding. Uh, and you'll want a drop sheet because this is going to be very messy. Um, so prepare to make a big mess and, you know, wear, wear your PPE, your personal protective equipment. So, you know, uh, gloves, you know, mask for you know, some of these chemicals um, can be toxic. Um, a lot of the chemicals that I work with uh, are relatively safe as far as the um, uh, the work, sa uh, sh uh, work safety data sheet um, goes, but that doesn't mean that they're you know perfectly safe for you to breathe in for long, long hours a day. I can attest to this because I once caught a lung infection from breathing in too many of these chemicals. So don't be dumb like me. Wear a mask. Um, <laughs> that said. Um, any free pour mold can be encased, oh sorry, must be encased, uh, that you can encase it in literally anything like a cardboard box or Tupperware or even Legos work. I've seen people like literally take Lego bricks, build a little fortress around their, the thing they want, and then demold it by simply just breaking apart their Lego fortress, which is really quite clever. Uh, and I definitely want to try that in the future the next time I need to make a free pour mold. Uh, Two-part molds uh, should be made using uh, brush-on, latex, silicone, rubber. Uh, most most brush-ons are usually a, a brush-on silicone or brush-on latex. Brush-on rubbers are a little bit harder to come by for whatever reason. <laughs> um, but the ones I usually use are Rebound 25, which is a brush-on latex, but you can use uh, any brush-on latex or rubber that you, or silicone that you want. There is no right or wrong answer, but just remember, that your master should be sulfur free just because um, the uh, silicone can inter uh, react poorly to sulfur in the clay, which can cause it to not cure properly or remain tacky or just have a weird clumps in it. So you don't want that because it's a big waste of time and a big waste of material, plus it creates a huge mess for you. Um, now, with Rebound 25 and similar brush on latexes, uh, the first layer that you put on should always be the thinnest. Uh, and the reason why you want it to be thin is so they can capture all the fine details that you put into making your original sculpt, be it a 3D printed sculpt or a one that you made out of clay. After you've got the first layer on, you can slowly bulk up the layers and to aid in that, you can use something called 5X, which is a thickening agent for uh, silicones and latexes. Uh, but there are, are other thickening agents. This is just the one I typically use. It's, you know, readily available um, from SmoothOn and similar companies, uh, from SmoothOn and distributors that sell SmoothOn products, uh, such as, if you're Canadian, Sculpture Supply Canada. Um, that said, once you have your mold, um, your actual mold ready with the latex, um, you're going to want to let it fully cure because whenever you're first putting the layers on, you're only going to let it partially cure between each layer so all the individual layers adhere together. But for making the mold jacket, you want to make sure that that uh, silicone latex is completely cured before you move on to the next step. And the next step will be to create some sort of dam separating, you know, the two halves of the face. So usually what I do is I take a bit of tin foil, I roll it up and create a giant noodle. Uh, and then I basically just duct tape the uh, tin foil 
to the fl uh, to uh, whatever drop sheet I have. I usually just use paper, and then I, you know, basically bend it over the curves of the face, and then on the half that I'm going to be making my mold jacket side on first, I put down serenite uh, wax, um, which is a wax that helps prevent uh, the uh, mold jacket from adhering permanently to your lovely mold. Um, that's because a lot of the materials you use to make mold jackets tend to be very, very sticky, and once they've cured, they kind of form a permanent bond to whatever they're touching. So you don't want a permanent bond between your mold and your mold jacket, otherwise you're never going to be able to get the thing that you're trying to cast out of the mold itself, and you've wasted a lot of time, tools, and materials. Um, so that's why you want to use something like a serenite wax, or you can also use, uh, what's it called? Uh, vapor rub uh, those also work well uh, but they're not designed for this so they can have some effect with the curing process of your mold jacket depending on um, you know what kind of product you're using uh, the ones that I use to make my mold jacket I usually use plastic paste um, as it is just one I'm familiar with there's you know no right or wrong answer in terms of what material to use or brand of silicone or um, uh, plaster-esque material uh, or fiber-esque material. Uh, the plastic paste is kind of a, an in-between between a fiberglass and plaster of Paris. Um, and actually it's probably more closer to fiberglass than I think about it than it is the plaster of Paris. Um, but you know they all have their pros and cons. But once you have done, uh, done that step where you basically create the dam and you serenite wax one half of the face and layer it up with the plaster of Paris, or sorry, the plastic paste or whatever mold jacket material you're using. You let it fully cure, and then you do the same thing with the other side. You serenite wax it. You don't remove your dam. You keep the dam there. You serenite wax it, um, and then you make your mold jacket. And then basically you let it clear. Maybe you add another layer to it if you feel it's a little thin in some parts, and then you can demold it. Um, so you that's basically removing the two halves of the shell, which is the mold jacket, um, and then you can remove the actual latex off of the base oh, uh, of the um, uh, co-host request decline. <laughs> I don't know who you are, but I'm I'm, I'm good. <laughs> um, gosh, what was I saying? Uh, you can then remove the uh, silicone off of your master sculpt, be it a clay or 3D printed one. Um, and then from there, you're basically ready to go. Whenever you're ready to cast, though, in the um, base itself, you'll definitely want to use a mold release. Well, you don't technically need a mold release uh, with a, um, a two-part mold just because the mold uh, itself is so thin and flexible you can kind of really just pull it out but this will slowly erode your mold over time as it will leave little pieces of um you know microscopic pieces of whatever material you cast it in the mold so a mold release agent is highly recommended um i use two different ones um gosh what is one of them has a really weird name to it it's like w94 i think or w93000 like nine, uh, 90 space, like dash 3000. I don't remember. It's a weird one. Um, but that one is specifically for demolding foam. But the problem is, is that it is very toxic. Um, so I don't recommend it, um, which is why I've kind of stopped using it a little bit. Um, the one I typically use uh, these days is the Smooth On Universal Mold Release. Um, it's also good because it is a spray one versus the W94 million thousand, whatever the fuck it's called, <laughs> um, is one you actually have to brush into the mold. So it is, a, you know, requires, you know, a little bit of actual preparation, whereas the spray one, you just spray it, wait 30 seconds, and then you can start using your mold right away or, or casting. Um, now, regarding making a uh, your master out of a 3D printed base, um, you'll obviously want to 3D model said base. Um, or you can commission someone, you know, an animator, a 3D modeler, another fursuit maker, how, whatever have you, to make a model for you. 
But modeling can be quite fun and quite rewarding because then you can get exactly what you want, especially once you are a little bit more practiced uh, in the programs. Now, obviously, there are, you know, fancy, you know, modeling programs or sculpting programs like ZBrush or Blender or even Maya, but they have quite a steep learning curve. So what I recommend is something like uh, Sculptress uh, and Tinkercad. These are the programs that I have been using the, for the past many a years. Uh, and the main reason why I use those programs was because my computer at the time was a $200 Lalfus computer, which couldn't handle shit. Um, I, now I have a, a fairly fancy computer compared to what I had before, so I'm able to um, use programs like ZBrush and Blender, though I have yet to actually do so. Um, the last time I used ZBrush and Blender-esque products or even Maya, I was still in college, so that was a good 10 years ago. Sorry, my nose is very itchy right now. Someone's probably talking shit about me. <laughs> Um, now, Sculptress um, is good because it is a 3D sculpting program, which means that you absolutely need to have zero um, uh, prior knowledge to 3D modeling. You can literally just open it up and you're ready to go. You don't need to learn anything. If you know how to sculpt with clay, you know how to 3D model with Sculptress. It is very, 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 it's that simple. But it does have some drawbacks. It has a limited model size in terms of the detail. Uh, in this case, it uses Tris uh, versus polygons. Um, so it's a very low poly count, essentially, in terms of how much detail you can implement it. I believe it's around 3 million Tris before the program crashes. And the reason why the program crashes is because it's an abandoned alpha. Uh, the product never made it past its alpha development stage uh, because the company that was developing it, which I believe was ZBrush, um, basically got, got bought out by Blender and then basically the program got canceled essentially because they're like Blender was like, oh, we don't care. <laughs> we don't care about this program. Um, so unfortunately you got to ban it, but it's still free so, and you can still download it. So feel free to download it. It just has, you know, its limitations, but I still use it. I've been using it, you know, quite heavily for a number of years and I like it. Now, uh, but with a 3D sculpting program like ZBrush, it has its limits in the sense that you can't make hard geometric shapes or get precise angles and things. So you'll want like an AutoCAD uh, software in that case. And Tinkercad is such a program. In fact, it's not even a program so much as a browser-based AutoCAD, meaning anyone can use it as long as you have a computer. Uh, you don't need to download anything. You don't even need to have a good computer. As long as you can run basic browser-based programs, you're good to go. And again, no required experience is necessary. It is extremely uh, easy to uh, navigate, and they give you a quick three-minute tutorial that literally teaches you what you need to know, and then the rest is literally just like, well, what if I want to do this? And then you can be like, you can play around with it, and you can get what you want to do. Uh, you can also import uh, Im uh, SFGs, SVGs, sorry, which are a type of image. Uh, and you can basically, what I usually do is I will basically draw um, what I want inside and I'll convert it to a vector SVG and then I'll import it to Tinkercad and it will create a flat two dimensional version of that object. So then I can just draw what I want piece by piece and then build it together in Tinkercad uh, which is a really kind of nice workaround uh, for the product because it does have its limited capabilities in terms of what it can and can't do like it can't draw in it you can't draw directly in it um, I think they've created a new draw tool or they were working on a draw tool uh, for the program but I'm not sure you know where it's at in terms of its development it was very much a prototype when I last played with it so, you know, I've been using, you know, Psy or other type of drawing programs to draw what I want, turn it into a vector, and then import it and then reassemble it, which is kind of funny, but it works. Uh, and then, of course, you can have your more in-depth programs like uh, Blender or ZBrush, uh, but those have a more intense learning curve and you usually have, need to have some sort of prior experience with some sort of kind of 3D modeling. So, for example, I, who've used... Tinkercad and Sculptress would have a better chance at understanding this program or these programs than had I never done anything. Um, 
and uh, that is actually my intention. I will go learn Blender and ZBrush now that I have a computer that can actually handle them, um, which is uh, a recent development for myself. Now, you can actually print a 3D mold, like a mold with a, with a printer uh, from a 3D model. So what you basically do is you take your whatever model that you've made, you invert it, um, and then the negative space creates the mold cavity, and then you basically need to encase your inverted mold in some sort of block uh, and merge them two together, and that creates essentially your print, uh, your mold. Sorry, someone is talking smack about me because my nose is so terribly itchy right now. It's not even funny. Ah, uh, sorry. Um, now, regarding 3D modeling uh, and 3D printing, you will need a printer because you can't really do that without the actual tool. <laughs> uh, well, you can always like outsource it. You can always find a, uh, an artist or someone with a printer who can print it for you. But it can be quite expensive because you're paying for their knowledge of the machine, um, their, the, their use of the machine, um, and the materials themselves. Now, 3D printing itself, once you know what you're doing, is inexpensive. But getting to that stage is quite the road because <laughs> uh, 3D printers are still quite new in terms of technology. They're getting a lot better than what they were, say, five years ago when I, when I first got my printer. Um, but uh, they still have quite the steep learning curve. And it requires you to learn not only how to operate the machine, but how to repair it when it breaks down. Because you're going to be a little hard pressed to find someone to repair your printer, depending on where you live. Um, you might have better luck if you live in like a big city like Toronto, or maybe even Ottawa, for example, if you're in Canada. But if you are like me in the middle of nowhere, you are not going to find anyone who knows how to repair a machine, not to mention getting the parts. You're not likely to have it on hand, so you have to order it. But once you know what you're doing, you can easily set yourself up and you can be ready for a while. Because um, the actual printer itself, um, you know, past, you know, the initial learning curve and the machine itself um, is quite easy to maintain and use. Um, that's at least when we're talking about filament printers. See, filament printers are more inexpensive. They tend to have a larger print volume, which means you could print an entire head on one single printer rather than having to break it up into multiple pieces and then reassemble it, you know, with glue or whatever. Um, you can print the entire thing. And they have a uh, 0.12 millimeter accuracy, which is pretty accurate. They're actually one of the most accurate uh, types of printers out there, which are basically two different minds, types of printers. Um, and they, uh, filament printers have different filaments for different jobs. So uh, you have basically two plastic type ones, which are, sorry, someone is talking smack about me because my nose is so itchy right now. I'm so sorry. Uh, but there are a couple different filaments. There is ABS and PLA. PLA is the most common one. I don't recommend ABS because it, whenever it actually heats up and it prints, it kind of stinks a little bit. Um, so most people don't use the, um, ABS for that reason. It's kind of stinky. It is a little toxic, but you don't, it's not nothing bad. You, I mean, most people don't stand and watch their 3D printer for the 30 hours it's going to take to print it, uh, which is another thing. People don't seem to realize how slow 3D printers are. Uh, for example, this head base, uh, how long do you think it, it took to print? A couple hours? Try a couple of days to a week of constant printing. It's, it's slow. It's a slow process. I printed a mold recently for uh, a customer of mine, and it took a week and a half to print the mold. It, it, and, and, it, and it failed two, three times during that process, so I had to restart. So it was, it's, it's, you know, it's a process. Um, but aside from ABS and PLA, uh, there are, oh gosh, uh, TPU, uh, which is a flexible filament. So you can print, for example, a nose, and it will actually be kind of squishy which is really interesting. The only problem with uh, TPU uh, and similar types of filaments is that they're a little bit on the pricey side and they, are, are, they can be quite finicky to get right uh, because the printers don't always like working with them because they're, they're designed more for an ABS or a PLA because they have different heating requirements um, and setting requirements. 
Aside from a filament printer, there are resin printers. Uh, resin printers tend to be quite a bit more expensive. They tend to have a smaller print volume, um, just because the ones that are really, really large that have the, you know, a similar print volume as, say, a CR10, which is a large print volume printer, uh, will be yeah, probably close to about 10 grand versus, say, uh, 800 bucks. <laughs> so, you know, that's why pe most people who have resin printers, they tend to be on the smaller side, but most people tend to use them just for claws or eyes or anything they want to be really, really smooth. And in fact, they tend to actually have a... Uh, they tend to be a little bit more accurate uh, than a filament printer. So instead of being a 0.12 millimeter accuracy, they tend to have be a 0.1 or 0.08 millimeter accuracy. But the accuracy isn't the main thing, the main draw with the resin printer. It's the fact that the layer lines are a lot smoother. Um, so the, the accuracy between the details is important, but the accuracy between the layer lines is what's the bigger draw for a resin printer because you can get a lot smoother, a lot cleaner of a print. And they're also a lot more easier to sand. You can also sandblast them a lot easier. If you sandblast the filament printer, you might actually erode the actual plastic itself, uh, burning a hole in it because it, uh, you essentially use heat in a lot of cases to sandblast uh, or because it's friction-based and friction generates heat. Uh, but these are a little bit more heat resistant um, as such uh, sandblasting and regular sanding or wet sanding uh, yields better results in creating a much smoother final version but the downside is that you absolutely need ventilation uh, in a lot of cases resin printers are actually fully enclosed just because they have a lot of toxic fumes uh, whenever they're actually operating um, and additionally you will usually need to uh, do some sort of UV, UV curing afterwards or acetone bath to remove any sort of chemicals or finish the actual process to harden it because it's usually fairly soft still when, you, when it actually comes off the bed. Um, I've never used a 3D printer. Sorry, that's a lie. I've used a 3D printer once um, and it was interesting, uh, but they're quite expensive. They're tricky to learn and they're very expensive. And as such, I went with the cheaper way and got a filament printer. Filament printers are also um, what most people think of when they talk about 3D printers. This is what most people are referring to when they say, oh, I have a 3D printer. 95% of the time it's gonna be a filament a printer. Um, as for the uses for 3D printing, aside from just making wonderful head bases, um, you can use it to uh, 3D print minis, uh, so like prototypes. So I have over here, oops, I'm knocking everything over. So I have over here, a miniature version of a mold that I made. So, and I actually made a miniature cast so I could show you guys it. So, I 3D modeled this, uh, 3D modeled the head uh, in Sculptress, and then I use an AutoCAD software, I use Tinkercad actually, uh, to basically invert the mold, and then I surrounded it in um, a, basically a box, and that created the mold itself, in which I printed this. This is a miniature version of the final print that happened. So I printed it, and this is what looks on the inside. It, you can see the concave, you can see the concave surface of the actual uh, head. And then I, you can basically cast directly in this. I didn't use a mold release for this little miniature version because again, this is just an example. And it's a prototype. And prototypes are great because you can always be like, oh, I really like this model. And then you print it and you're like, mm, no, this wasn't exactly what I was expecting. Because, you know, seeing something on a computer screen and seeing something in person are two very different experiences um, because you know being able to move it and touch it and feel it are you know sensory so you, know, you can cast it directly in your miniature version of the mold and this is casted out of foam you can see exactly what this little guy looks like uh, and this is what is this guy this guy is a little kimono fox uh, mold that we made um, so this was a prototype of, of that kimono kind of fox mold that we did. Um, we ended up being like, oh, actually, we didn't like this shape, so we changed some things. Like, I remember we ended up changing um, uh, the eyebrows, I believe, in this. I think we made the eyebrows a little bit bigger, but, you know, that's kind of the versatility of printing um, pro uh, prototypes because you're able to, you know, test it and adjust it before you go full scale, which saves a lot of time and, um material sorry i'm still hiccuping oh excuse me 
Another thing you can do is you can print uh, miniature versions of things and then scale it up. So in this case, I 3D modeled some DigiGrade legs, which I used to then pattern uh, over here. And I scaled that pattern up and that pattern ended up being used to create uh, Miles the Fox, his bodysuit. I actually, this is, this is what his bodysuit essentially looks like. I did end up changing some things, like for example, this black here is actually clay, because uh, when I 3D printed it, uh, which is the white, I realized, oh, I don't actually like this shape as much as I thought I did. But rather than going back and adjusting it with my, with my 3D modeling and reprinting it, I knew that, um, you know, in this particular case, such it was just going to be such big, large, round shapes, small indiscrepancies weren't going to matter too much. So I just sculpted it over with clay, and then I patterned it, literally patterned this tiny little thing that's about yay big, uh, with duct tape, cut it out, labeled it, and then I made a grid, as you can see here, and then I scaled it up to uh, fit uh, Miles' body, and that's how I made his bodysuit. Um, and then, because I like the pattern so much, I end up keeping it, and now all I do is I make minor adjustments to fit each customer's. Um, so yeah, you, there's a lot of different things you can use 3D printing for. It's very versatile. Um, you know, it has its drawbacks. Again, you know, steep learning curve. Um, you know, where you have to learn how to you know, repair and maintain your machines, etc. My nose is extremely itchy, and I don't know why today. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah. And yeah, actually, yeah, so this is actually the, I believe, the final version of this one. So this is the, the final version. Uh, this was the first time I think we'd end up doing a 3D printed mold. So we actually end up filling the inside with the resin to try and make it a little bit smoother and make it a little bit easier to uh, demold. It turns out that wasn't really necessary uh, because as long as you print it at a good uh, millimeter like layer height or uh, detail um, you don't really need to do it because the layer the layer lines are going to be terribly visible and you're going to be furring it anyway so it doesn't really matter um gosh my nose is so itchy i'm so so sorry um now let's talk about hand wefting and nft so nft also stands for natural fiber technologies and they are uh, fibers that are hand blended and woven to create unique furs. Uh, they're usually very long piles. So whereas a long pile fur is usually around three, maybe maybe four inches if you're very lucky, uh, an NFT can be like 10, 12 inches long. They can be ridiculously long. Uh, they also have a four-way stretch, which is fantastic, and you can even make and you can even get uh, an NFT that is gradient. So gradient furs are a possibility if you don't mind spending a lot of money because they're very expensive as they are sold by the square foot as opposed to by the yard or by the meter an nft if you were to buy a yard of nft it could cost you as much as 600 dollars american which is just nuts for a yard of fabric when you can, when a normal yard of fabric is like mm, 25 40 dollars 25 to 40 dollars depending on where you're getting it from the quality of the fur the length of the fur the quality um but yeah uh, but uh nft is uh you know a very infamous uh it's used by a lot of movie uh it's used a lot in the film industry for example uh, Chewbacca, Star Wars, uh, his, the costume was, was made entirely out of NFT, and the, 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 the fur uh, cost to make him costs several thousands of dollars to produce. We're talking maybe like three to four thousand dollars American just to get the fur to produce it, let alone the labor. It's nuts. So because NFT is so expensive, it's not really practical to make an entire fursuit out of it, as cool as that would be. Uh, unless you're rich and you're in the film industry um, and want to make a Chewbacca, um, it's not really practical. Which is why a lot of people use, uh, you know, they either actually just use faux fur and they just layer it to make it look like hair, or they hand weft it. Uh, hand wefting is a term used by wig makers and sometimes cosplayers, uh, and it's similar to NFT. It's a lot of the same sort of steps. Um, you, where you hand blend um, and sew individual strands of candy collin. Now, candy collin is wig hair, um, and it's a specific type of wig hair uh, because it is somewhat heat resistant, uh, which is kind of important uh, in the wig making industry because if you need to style a hair uh, permanently, 
uh, you don't want it to melt <laughs> because it's still plastic and plastic melts. Um, so you weave together individual strands to make wefts, uh, which are then sewn together to create hair. You can also texturize it a little bit to create a similar appearance to fur, and not that it'll have the same softness as fur, but it can. It, it's a more close mimic to NFT uh, and actual hair is than fur, uh, because uh, NFT is even a perfect uh, replica of fur because it's not faux fur in the same way. It doesn't have the same sort of softness or the same sort of density because it is individual strands of hair, so it's a lot sparser uh, than faux fur. But you know, it can. It's that's why most uh, fur suit makers tend to use it for hair. It's again not desirable for a full suit for multiple reasons, aside from it costing a lot. Um, now, hand wefting is very, very labor intensive, but it's very cheap to make. Um, a large lion's mane, for example, could cost as little as twenty dollars American, but it could take it upwards of thirty dollars, a uh, thirty hours to manufacture because you have to sew each individual weft by hand uh, or on a machine rather but it's still it's still a lot of work um, but I will talk a little bit about how you actually weft um, so in order to make uh, some hand wefts uh, to, in order to, to make some uh, wefts for uh, a fursuit head let's say you want to make a big mohawk for example on a, on a hyena because hyenas have big mohawks that's, that's quite common what you're going to do is you're going to go out and you're going to buy what's called a conic column braid. And depending on what you're doing, you're going to need several of these braids. Now, the braids can be sold around 20 inches or around 40 inches in length. I usually buy the larger of the two braids, and the braids are quite inexpensive. They'll cost you anywhere from 2 to $10 a braid. So uh, it depends a lot mostly on the length of the braid, the type of conic column it is, because there are different types, and the color. Um, and what you want to do is you want to cut them roughly two to three inches longer than what you the final product is. So say if you want a mohawk that is eight inches tall or long, you'll want to cut uh, your end of your strands of conic column to be about 10, 12, 11 inches long versus eight. You're going to take two strips of masking tape, uh, one inch, two inch, uh, or half inch masking tape. I'm oh, sorry one sorry half inch to one and a half inch masking tape like in terms of thickness you don't want too much more you're going to lay them flat so you're going to take one strip and you're going to lay it flat on the ground with the sticky side facing up you're going to take it back off about a couple inches maybe one inch and then you're going to lay another strip face up then in the gap you're going to lay all of your candy column strings so the longer side is further away from your two strips of kind of call uh, of your masking tape then you're going to take another two strips of masking tape and you're going to put them on top of the, the two masking strips that are already on the ground or whatever area you're working on to basically sandwich them together you're basically just trying to make it so you're able to pick this up and put in the sewing machine because if you just take hair like try to put your hair into a sewing machine and sew it it's not gonna work well for you it's too flimsy so the reason why we add masking tape is to help give it some give us something to hold on to a in the sewing machine and b we need to be able to designate the area that we want to make harder and the way we make it harder is by spraying it with layers and layers and layers of hairspray until the hair goes crunch um which is typically not what you want to do if you're styling your own hair for example but for fursuit making and for the sake of making uh hand wefts you absolutely want to just spray just like coat it, just layer after layer with hairspray until it goes crunch. Then in your sewing machine, uh, you're going to want to zigzag stitch or serge it if you have a serger um, four times per side. So you put it in the machine, put it in the machine, put it in the machine four times and then you flip it around, don't trim the threads, and then you repeat that process another four times. Once you have a total of four uh, stitches on each side you're going to basically fold it in half along the seam so that the two halves of the masking tape are meeting and you have a seam where you basically just spent the last 20 minutes sewing back and forth eight times then you're going to once again sew it again another four times per side this is to basically help 
try to get as many uh, individual hairs to basically interlock because if you just had like one stitch you're missing all of these hairs and they're all just going to pull through in the gaps in between so you want to create as little of a space between the stitches as possible so that as few hairs as possible escape through that gap once you have uh, once you have sewn it and you know like this this 16 times um, you're going to remove the masking tape. You can just simply cut it off or pull it out and you're going to trim the excess hair along the seam. Uh, you don't want to, you want to trim it close, but not so close that you're going to accidentally cut your seam or, uh, pull all the hairs out because that's kind of the piece of purpose. And then you're going to repeat this process until your fingers fall off. Literally, uh, until you have enough wefts, individual wefts to um, make your the desired product to make for example a lion's mane or a giant mohawk for uh, an obstagoon which was something that I did recently. Once you have all these individual strands together you're going to layer them. So you're gonna have one weft here and you're gonna have another one and you're going to basically sew them on top so just a little bit of the area is touching and then you're gonna continue doing that this way going this way. So you're gonna have one two and then you're gonna have another one here another one here and you're gonna layer them that way uh over and over and over and over again until you have the desired bulk that you want um after that point you can actually sew it to whatever you want say if it's a tail like a big uh, mo uh mane on a tail or tail tuft or a big lion's mane you can sew it down to your final product after that you're going to take some hairdressing shears and you're essentially just going to shear it all to uh, to the desired length and texturize it. This will help give it a more natural look and it can also help, help more closely mimic the uh, appearance of fur, although it won't have the texture, like the, the hand feel of fur. Um, and that's basically how you hand weft. It's a very time consuming process. I did an obstacle recently and I was working on that obstacle for like two, three days. <laughs> It's a lot of sewing. <laughs> it's boring, but it's cheaper than buying NFT, and you're also able to control exactly what you want in terms of the length. And you can make mix individual strands of candy column together to create more natural looks, um, to create uh, hair. Because like your hair, if you look at your hair, I have brown hair. My hair isn't brown. I have multiple strands of individual hairs of different colors that all blend together to create brown. Um, so you, you can do something like that uh, and then you're able to get very specific shades of colors. Um, you can't really get gradients up the same way. You can create a gradual fade from one color to another going this way but not going this way. If that makes sense. So if I do it this way, looking at my hair, I can make a gradient going from the left side of my face to the right side of my face and vice versa. But I couldn't make, you know, the top of my head go from pink to purple. Uh, you know, because unless I bought candy column that was already gradient in that way, I don't have that kind of fine tuned control. But that's the basics of the hand wafting. Very versatile, but it does have its limits. A lot cheaper than NFT, but a lot more labor inducive. Um, and I think this is the last thing I wanted to talk about. Yes. Uh, so the last thing is, uh, printing. Um, now when you're f making eyeballs, uh, toony eyes specifically, a lot of people, uh, paint their eyes. Now painting eyes is fantastic. You can get a lot of wonderful details in painting eyes, but the cost of that is time. And you can spend several hours uh, painting a single set of eyeballs. And it can be a little difficult to get them to be perfectly symmetrical. Of course, you know, people who paint eyes constantly for their fursuit heads are definitely very good at getting them uh, to be very, very, very uh, symmetrical looking. But they're not going to be as perfect as, say, a computer. Because humans are not machines. Now, I print my eyeballs, but I do not print them myself. Because to print them myself, I would need a very specific uh, type of printer, either one uh, that is designed for printing directly onto fabric, or what they call uh, supplemental printing, or even silk screening. Um, so you can't really do it at home. I've seen some people try to use home printers to print eyes, but the only way you can print eyes with a home printer is if you're printing on buckram, because buckram is a material that has a 
lot of holes that are very close together so there's more surface area so it's able to absorb the paint it's also um, a porous material so the ink is able to seep into it versus where most fursuit makers like myself we tend to use an Ida cloth which is a vinyl like material and because of how uh, slick that is the ink just sits on top of it rather than actually permeating the surface so it never dries um, so you can actually you know you could use a home printer print on vinyl let it sit for a week and it would still be wet and it would still smudge and come off immediately with the faintest of touch because it's not a surface design for it and this also isn't your home printer is not a special printer designed for this sort of thing so you can actually outsource it uh there's a local graphics company to me that i usually outsource mine they um uh, print um uh, designs for actually like people's cars and you know big bull billboard signs and making decals uh in ice <laughs> Uh, which is actually the material that I use. Um, the I actually use ice material to, to print my eyes on because, you know, the details, you know, whenever you go to a, a hockey, a skating rink or a hockey game or whatever, to which I've done neither of those things because I hate sports, but at least I know they exist. <laughs> um, you, you, the designs that you can see in the ice, those are printed on ice material um, so that you know, because uh, it has to have holes in it so that the water can go through. But those holes for fursuit makers also means that I can see. <laughs> um, so it's they're they're quite useful in that in that sense. Um, so I I go to a local graphics company and I basically be like, here, print these. <laughs> um, but that's not to say you can't print them yourselves. You do need specialized printers. They can be costly. Uh, supplemental ink printing uh, is cheaper. Um, but direct to fabric printing is more expensive, but you can get a lot more color accuracy. Um, but yeah, you know, either way, either way, regardless of what methodology, printing saves you time and time saves you money. And printing ensures that every eye is identical and symmetrical and you can repeat them. So if someone says, oh, I really like that eye that you did, you can be like, cool, I can print that exact eye. Or they can be like, well, I can try to recreate it because as wonderful as humans are and as wonderful painters as some of you wonderful folks out there are, it's very difficult to replicate the exact same pattern and the exact same color scheme twice, especially when you have to hand mix your uh, paint so you get the exact colors you want. That said, uh, I think that's pretty much it that I wanted to talk about. So I wanted to say thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Kale. I am the owner of Twilight Nights Company. I also uh, sell faux fur. I started a faux fur company called Canfur because you can fur with Canadian furs because as a fursuit, a Canadian fursuit maker, the one thing that we always struggle with is finding and, and getting faux fur in Canada because faux fur in Canada tends to be very expensive or very poor quality. And a lot of us Canadian fursuit makers have to import from the U.S., which drives up the cost significantly, turning that $25 U.S., uh, uh, U.S. dollar yard of fabric into, say, $75, $100 U.S. for a yard of fabric after importing and shipping. It, it's quite costly. So that's why I started Canfer to give Canadian fursuit makers, as well as other fursuit makers out there, a chance to get some cheaper uh, fabric as well as in some rare colors. Again, thank you all for watching. Uh, for those who are watching this in the future at Fernal Equinox, I'm sadly not going to be taking any questions. But, um, mostly just because I'm not live to take questions, but feel free to give me a shout at the convention, because I will be vending uh, at the convention during the weekend, and I will be taking commissions, both for, you know, weekend commissions and also for suit commissions themselves, because I'm actually open right now. Surprise, surprise. Once again, thank you all for watching. My name is Kale, and I'll see you all in the future.